this morning. And we just thank you, Lord, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father God, we thank you this morning for the great opportunity we have to gather in your name. God, this world looks like a very different place. This week we faced earthquakes and, and violence and, and peaceful protests and um, protests that just weren't honoring and pleasing to you. And, and God, just all kinds of things just going on in our world. But God, we look to you this morning, Lord. We just lay our, our lives in your hands, Lord, and we ask for you just to meet us, God, that you would restore us, that you would strengthen us, that you would pick us up, Lord, that even in the midst of the storms, that we can find peace and rest in calm in you. Now, Lord, my heart's desire this morning is something I wrote down in my journal this week from... Proverbs 3 that says, I long to know Christ. We long to know you this morning, Lord, and to experience your personal presence in each of our lives, that we would find companionship with you in the most intimate of ways. God, help us to realize this morning that nothing else matters, not any of these distractions of this world.
So have your Bibles out and have them ready to the book of Genesis. All places and find Genesis in chapter 4. And um, the title of my message today is Where It All Started. The book of Genesis. 
It'll all make sense to you in a minute, okay? Where it all started. But the book of Genesis, it's a book of beginnings. Genesis records the beginning of the universe, the beginning of the world, the sun, the moon, the stars, the animal life, the plants, the plant life, the human life, along with many other important things. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, many first things appear. The first man, the first woman, the first command from God, the first marriage, the first home, but also the first sin, the first death, the first sacrifice, the first worship, the first murder, the first curse, and so on and so on. In this passage we're going to read today in Genesis chapter 4, the Lord gives us a glimpse inside the world's first family. The world's first family of Adam and Eve and their two sons, and two of their sons anyway, Cain and Abel. And I think it's appropriate because their story really illustrates the heart and what we are experiencing today. With the recent murder of George Floyd, among others, the sin of hatred, jealousy, murder, and racism. You know, while there are many great truths in this passage, one stands higher than others, at least for me. In the life of Cain, I see a portrait of every lost sinner who has ever lived. Cain is an, arch, an archetype, a prototype of every sinner who would follow him into this world. When I look at Cain, I see the embodiment of Proverbs 16.25, which says this, there, seem, there is a way that seems right to man. But the end is the way of death. That verse describes the life of Cain perfectly. It also describes the life of all those who live by, who live not by faith, but who walk after the flesh. It is a lifestyle the Bible calls the way of Cain in June, June 11. This passage reveals the characteristics of those who refuse to live life according to God's will, His word, and His law. And when you hear these characteristics, I, want, I would ask you to examine your own heart today. If you see these characteristics, characteristics in your life, it indicates that you need to be saved. Now, I would encourage you to believe the gospel and to look to Christ for salvation. If you are saved, and you see any of these characteristics we're going to go through, then I challenge you to lift them up in prayer and determine in your heart that you will give them to the gospel of grace. So let's read right now from Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 14. And today I need to put some glasses on. So. Right at four, chapter 4, right at verse 1. It says, Adam knew his wife, laid with his wife. There's other words you can use for there too. And she became pregnant and gave birth to, to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And, we'll get, and God gave her a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept, kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel, he brought the fat portions, the firstlings, right, as an offering to the Lord uh, from his first, uh, firstborn on the flock. The Lord looked with favor, with respect, with acceptance on Abel and his offering. But on Cain, he and his offering, he did not look upon with favor. He did not look upon with respect. He did not look at uh, accepting the offering. So this made Cain very angry. In fact, his face was wroth, is the old uh, King James Version. He was downcast. His countenance just like fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you will do what is right, will you, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Sounds like a wild beast here. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go to the field. And while they were there, there in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel, and he killed him. He murdered him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where's your brother Abel? I always like that. 
It's like God knows, okay, but he's always, you know, he wants to give us an opportunity. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, in all sarcasm, right? Uh, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you. First of all, you're a God who gives us opportunities, Lord. With all this uh, destruction going on right now, with the death of George Floyd, Lord, with all this, uh, the injustice of that, the racism, Lord, the hatred, with all the rioting, looting, you know, with the loss of life, Lord, we need you to intervene, Lord. We need you to be here with us today, Father. We need your hand to guide us and direct us and give us answers that only can come from you. And that answer, as Mindy said earlier, Lord, is that it is Jesus Christ. He brings healing. He brings understanding. He brings salvation, Lord. And sin has to be getting rid of, gotten rid of first, before we can get rid of any racism, any hatred, any thoughts of murder, Lord. And I pray, Father, as we go through this passage today, Lord, that you take unbelieving hearts and make them believe. You take hearts, Lord, that are far from you, that it's this time for repentance, Lord. And I just pray right now, Father, that you look upon our hearts today, Father. You give us your grace and your mercy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, this chapter, it really begins with a great hope. You know, after Adam and Eve, they sinned, they sinned in the Garden of Eden. They were cast out of this beautiful garden by the Lord. And this is, that's back in Genesis chapter 3. And God placed an angel with a flaming sword at the entrance of Eden to prevent Adam and Eve from, re, from re-entering the garden and eating from the tree of life. Now, Adam and Eve, they were forced to eke out a meager existence, you know, by working the ground for their food. Their lives, which have been so perfect before they sinned, it has now changed in every way. Now their lives revolve around hard work, unending drudgery, and boundless regret. The days of walking with the Lord in the cool of the garden, that's over. They were consigned to a life of pain, a life of sorrow, a life of toil, and a life eventually leading to death. All hope seemed gone. Then in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. She got pregnant. Suddenly, there's hope. An opportunity for new life. Suddenly, in the face of certain death, there was the wonder of new life. The hope of a new beginning and the promise of a better tomorrow. So a new life has begun. Eve, you know, she must have really been excited about the baby just growing in her womb. You know, I can just imagine her calling Adam over, hey, Adam, come over and feel the baby kick. Right? You know, I can just see him placing his ear up against her belly, just listening to the baby's heartbeat. You know, just the, all the new possibilities, the renewed hope, you know, the excited expectations, because no one's had a baby before. So that's why they call it expecting. <laughs> right? Then one day, the wait is over. Eve gave birth to the first baby born into the world. Eve was the first woman to experience the pain of childbirth. Right? And you know, and on the heels of that experience, she was also the first woman to experience the joy of a newborn baby in her arms. Eve, she named the baby Cain. And that name, it means I have gotten. In fact, I have gotten a man from the Lord, is what it means. Eve, she gives glory to God for her newborn baby. She saw the birth as a time of divine blessing in her life, in her family, and in her world. Then came another baby, whom they named Abel. His name means breath, breathe, vapor, perishable. The name would prove prophetic, as her second son perished like a breath exhaled exhaled into the air. Think for a moment about George Floyd and some of his last words. Now, some think Cain and Abel, they may have been twins. 
whether they were, were or not, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that the sadness of Adam and Eve over their sin and over their lost fellowship with God is somewhat mitigated by their children. Those babies brought hope into the world that must have seemed so hopeless. Babies possess that power, don't they? They often they, they bring joy, they bring laughter, they bring hope, bring you know for tomorrow. When those tiny little wiggling you know toes and crying creatures come into the world, there are a lot of joy. When I see my granddaughter and my daughter too, by the way, Megan, you're out there, I know. Uh, when I see my granddaughter the other day, she was sitting on her little port, her little like training potty, right, and she had a xylophone in her lap, and she was singing. Uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star, like a diamond in the sky, right? And she's just sitting there, and she's playing it, bing, 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 bing. Yes, she's only two years old, but what joy that brings. In fact, I had to share it yesterday. I, I, I ran into Dolores, mom, Dolores, yesterday, and shared it with her and stuff. And so it's just babies can bring that kind of joy. Can they bring pain, too? Yes, especially when they turn about 13 and 14. But anyway, she brings that kind of joy into the world. Now these two boys, think about these two boys, they grew up together, they grew up together, they grew up together in the same household. You know, they have the same parents. They receive the same instructions. They see the same things. You know, they share the same experiences. But they grew up. They grew up. As, I meant it this way. As they grew up, differences began to emerge. Isn't that amazing? People raised in the same home. And there's such a difference between the children, okay? I have three brothers, and we are so distinctly different from each other. First of all, I'm better looking. <laughs> and my brother in China, my brother Kirk, who's in China right now, he's watching, I know, and he knows that I'm, I'm right. Well, I'm better looking, okay? Now, he might be smarter, but I'm better looking, okay? So there, see, we all have our little differences, okay? Uh, my brother Ed is very athletic. You know, very, very athletic. I mean, um, you know, he's got, he's got the athletic skills. I'm not going to talk about my, my oldest brother, Garrett. We, there's a whole other story there altogether. But anyway, when it, and then what happens is when it came to choose a job, you know, they both chose honorable professions. You know, Cain, he followed his father's footsteps. Doesn't that, don't you just love that? When your child follows in your footsteps, he becomes a farmer. And Abel, he becomes a shepherd. Now, both locations were important, and it helped to, to sustain their family. They needed the kind of, uh, they needed shepherds, and they needed farmers. And at some point, probably as they reached young adulthood, you know, these young men, they came before the Lord, come before the Lord, and they worship. Now, I'm sure they were trained by their parents on how to approach God, how to worship God. Now, can you imagine the evangelists that Adam and Eve would have been? They knew God. You know, they knew what it was like to walk with God. They, you think about this, they knew what it was like to lose, and then they also, not that they only know how, what it was like to walk with God, but the contrast is that, of that is they also know how to lose that sweet fellowship with God. You know, they were there when God confronted them over their sin. They were there when God killed an animal to, to provide a, a covering for their nakedness. Now, I can imagine Adam and Eve, you know, how, you know, I can imagine how they shared that information with their sons. Could you imagine also the confession they would have had to make too? That, that part would probably, really, probably would have really hurt. Now, I wonder how many times Adam, he's, just think about this, as a father, he takes his sons, he puts them on his knees, right, and he tells them all about God and how he's to be worshipped. I wonder how many times Eve would have gone to her sons and says, listen to the Lord, don't listen to the devil. Right? I think we need to tell our kids that more and more, don't we? Listen to the Lord. Don't listen to the devil. So, in verses uh, 3 and 4 here, we have Cain and Abel. They come, they come to God to make an offering. And the Bible says in verse 4 that the Lord, uh, he had respect. He had, he had accepted. He found favor for Abel in his offering. But then over in verse 5, it says with Cain, for his offering... He showed no respect. He didn't accept it. He didn't, he didn't have his approval for it. Now Cain, he brought of the fruit of the ground. While Abel, he brought the fat of the flock. 
God approved Abel's offering while he rejected Cain's. Now, what was the difference? Now, I've heard all kinds of theories about this. All right, uh, why, one is, uh, why one is accepted and one is rejected. God did not accept Abel's offering over Cain's simply because Abel's was a blood sacrifice. God did not reject Cain's sacrifice simply because it was not an animal sacrifice. Because we have instances in both Deuteronomy and Leviticus where God tells Israel to offer a grain offering, offer a food offering. And he, accept, he, he accepted that as an offering. The, first, the fruit of the field was therefore an offering accepted by God. However, the primary necessary sacrifices were all blood sacrifices in which an innocent substitute died for guilty sinners. In the Garden of Eden, God, he established a pattern. A pattern for approaching him. That has never changed. The ultimate sacrifice was made when Jesus Christ came into the world and gave his life for sinners on the cross. He shed, he shed his perfect, sinless blood to redeem the lost, to satisfy the demands of a God over sin and wash a sinner clean. There's only one way for man to come to God. You see it there in the Garden of Eden. We saw it in, the, in Egypt at Passover. You know, you see it throughout the long history of worship in Israel. And it culminates at Calvary when Jesus, our Lord Jesus, the Son of God, was judged in the place of sinners. While that all must be a part of what's happening here, I think there's something deeper taking place. Notice the wording of verse 4. Abel, he carefully selected, he carefully made preparations. He carefully selected the best animal he had, and he took the time to prepare the sacrifice. He brought it before the Lord, and he offered it in faith. It appears that Abel, he went out his way to offer a sacrifice that was pleasing to the Lord. Abel's sacrifice said that he believed in God, that he believed God, and his faith was accepted by the Lord. His his Think about this. His sacrifice revealed the condition of his heart. He loved God. He honored God. He honored God's word. He believed in God's promise to send a Savior. And according to verse 5, God both accepted Abel and his offering. Now Cain, on the other hand, said to have brought the fruit of the ground. But is there any evidence of faith in the promises of God? Is there any evidence of preparation? Cain's offering said, you, you know what? I know what you said, God, but here's what I'm going to give you. All right? Take it or leave it. Cain's offering was an act of false worship. It was done, and whose way was it done in? It was not, was it done in God's way? It was done in Cain's way. Cain is saying this. My way will work just as well as your way. He found out instantly that it didn't work that way because God rejected both Cain and his offering. It seems to me that Cain was merely following a form. He was conducting a religious act. And there was no more love in his heart for God or gratitude to God for his blessings. There seems to be a lot of this going on today, doesn't it? People are out there doing what? Making up their own religion, basically. Living for what? Living for, for themselves. There's a warning here that we need to heed. God will not accept our religion. He will not accept our works. He will not accept anything we can do to attempt to save ourselves. The only thing that God will accept is what he's already provided. He will accept nothing but faith in the atoning sacrifice and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Cain revealed his lost condition through an unbelieving heart. He refused to come to God God's way. In short, he rejected the gospel of grace. He rejected the gospel of grace, and God rejected him. What does your heart say about you? Have you believed the gospel? 
Are you trusting Jesus Christ and what he did upon the cross is the only hope you have for salvation? Or is your hope in other things? Things like good works, religious deeds, a good life. Those kind of things are not going to save you. God's plan is simple. It's in Romans 10, 9. It says this. If you should confess with your mouth that Jesus, that Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So, Cain, we have an, with Cain here, we have an unbelieving heart. Verses 5 through 7, they go in a little bit deeper here, describing an unrepentant heart. There's a lot of people out there who are unbelievers, but there's also a lot of people out there who are unrepentant. So as soon as Cain realized that his offering had been rejected by God, the Bible says his countenance fell. His face went sad. He had that sad face. right? His demeanor changed. He couldn't understand why God would accept Abel's offering and reject his. We have a lot of people, we have many people out there who are fooling themselves into thinking that they're all right with God. But God knows what's in Cain's heart. So in verses 6 through 7, God speaks to Cain and asks him, Why is he upset? Really, he's asking, Why are you burning with anger? Why are you burning with anger and jealousy? God tells Cain in verse 7 that if he did what was right, he would be accepted too. I don't think God is telling Cain to get the right kind of sacrifice. I think the Lord is calling him to change his heart toward the Lord. God wants Cain to repent of his attitude toward God and walk with God in faith, humility, and submission like his brother Abel. God is looking to produce a change of heart and a change of mind in Cain. God warns to him that sin is like a wild beast just crouching at the door, ready to pounce upon him. That beast is way to pounce upon Cain and devour him. If Cain will come to God God's way, then he can have power over the beast. If he doesn't change, repent, and honor God's way, then sin will control him. We know which way Cain chose. We, knows what, we know what happens when people sin. There is going to be consequences. And it's not always just consequences with God either. He refused to repent. He refused to love God. He refused to walk in God's plan. And sin consumed him. Every unbeliever who has passed through this world since Cain has had the same problem. They possess an unrepentant heart. The lost sinner is a slave to sin and to Satan. God calls the lost to repent of their sins. To turn to him and to walk in his will. His word and his ways. That is the only path that leads to heaven. There are no other paths to heaven. All roads lead to hell. If you are lost, you need to know that sin will consume you unless you turn from it and come to God. You may think you are calling the shots in your life. You may think that you're the master of your own destiny. The truth is very different. Sin is deceptive, a deceptive and cruel master. It will lead you along with its pleasures and will entice you with his promises. But Proverbs 23, 32 tells us this. At, la at the last, it will, it will bite you like a serpent. It will sting you like a scorpion. The path of sin always leads to disillusionment. It always leads to disillusionment, defeat, and to death. The path of sin always leads away from peace, hope, and joy. The path of sin always ends in the fires of hell. I think we just experienced this these last few days, didn't we? haven't we? There's but one remedy for sin, and that remedy is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for our sins and for sinners. He gave his life so that you might have a new life. He came to those who, like Abel, understand that they need a Savior. He came for the lost. He didn't come for the, he didn't come for the righteous. He came as a physician, treats one who is sick. He didn't call the righteous, but he called sinners to repent. God cannot help someone like Cain. No one can. 
The person who refuses to acknowledge his spiritual condition and who refuses to repent of sin cannot and will not be saved. All those who are lost or remain that way, they're characterized by an unrepentant heart because Cain had an ungodly heart. In Cain's case, as in the case of every other sinner, the condition of the heart determined the course of his life. The beast of sin pounced upon Cain and devoured his heart, his conscience, and even his love for his brother, which led to murder. Now notice how sin manifests itself in Cain's life. Verse 8 tells us that Cain murdered his brother. Why did Cain kill Abel? He was jealous. Abel had something Cain did not have. Abel had a faith relationship with God. And unbelievers always, always demonstrate their animosity and anger toward people of faith. Cain's hatred of God manifests itself in his hatred of Abel. The anger toward God in his heart revealed itself in the murder of his brother. And in verse 9, God comes to Cain and asks him, where's your brother? And Cain sarcastically answers, am I my brother's keeper? And in verse 10, God tells Cain that he knows what Cain has done. He says the blood of Abel cries out to, the ground, to, to him from the ground where it was shed, where his blood was shed. The blood of Abel was not silent. It cried out for justice, and justice was what Cain received. Right now, the blood of George Floyd is crying out for justice. And what I want you to see here is a fundamental biblical truth. The condition of the heart determines the course of, of life, of the life. What is seen in the life externally, externally is a revelation of the character of the heart internally. In Cain's life, sin manifests its control in anger, in jealousy, in hatred, murder, and lying on top of all that. All of those actions prove that Cain possessed an unrepentant, an unredeemed, ungodly heart. Now, while we're not to stand in judgment of one another, the truth still applies today. The life always reveals the condition of the heart. We can profess, we can profess to anything, but the truth of what we, what, we, what we are is revealed in the way we walk. It's revealed in the way we talk. It's revealed in the way we think. It's revealed in the way we approach God. So what does your life say about the condition of your heart? Now I want to pause for a moment here to address what's going on in our world today. Racism, in varying forms and to various degrees, it has, it has been a plague on humanity for thousands of years. All the way back to this time in the Bible. While there is no ethnicity that can claim to be exclusive recipients of racism, blacks, Africans are recipients of racial injustice, prejudice, and discrimination more than any other ethnic group in most parts of the world. And here in the United States in recent years, we've seen numerous high profile examples of black men being treated unjustly, to say the very least, by police officers, or even ex-police officers. It's distressing, it's shocking, and for some it's rage-inducing to see a black man die due to the treatment he received when a person of any other ethnicity or race under the same circumstances would have probably just received a slap on the wrist. God does not show partiality or favoritism. He is no respecter of persons, and neither should we. James 2.4 describes those who discriminate as judges of evil thoughts. Instead, we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. In the Old Testament, God divided humanity really into two racial groups, Jews and Gentiles. God's intent was for the Jews to be a kingdom of priests, ministering to the Gentiles. Instead, for the most part, the Jews became proud of their status. They despised the Gentiles. But Jesus Christ came. He put an end to that. He destroyed the dividing walls of hostility. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. 
all forms of racism, all forms of prejudice, all forms of discrimination are affronts to the work of Christ on the cross. Jesus commands us to love one another as he loves us. John 13, 34. If God is impartial and loves us with impartiality, then we need to love others with the same high standard. Jesus teaches in Matthew 25 that whatever we do unto the least of these, my brethren, we do unto him. So if we treat, if we treat a person with contempt, if we're mistreating a person created by created in God, by God, in God's image. We are hurting somebody whom God loves and for whom Jesus died. Clearly, our, our society, it needs healing. And specific solutions might come in a variety of ways. But, why does humanity even have this problem? For each of us as individuals, what is the solution? Racism has been a problem throughout human history. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the reason why. Why? The simple answer is this. It's very simple. Sin. We harbor evil thoughts about other people and commit evil acts against other people because of sin. Sin appears to make us innately suspicious of people who look differently than us. Racism is clearly, biblically speaking, evil. If I have both, I gave you two references. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, and James 2, 8. I love when Martin Luther King uh, said this, that his dream was that we would be a nation where people are not judged by the color of their skin, but judged by the content of their character. Only through the transformative power of salvation in Jesus Christ can, rest, can racism be overcome. Only through seeing all other people as being created in the image of God can we rid ourselves of racial prejudices. The only lasting solution is the power and work of God. We are, we are secure. When we are secure in our identity in Christ, resting fully in his forgiveness and his love, we are less likely to be defensive over the issue of racism. It comes as no surprise that to us that human hearts, including our, our own, they harbor sin. It also comes as no surprise that God transforms people and brings healing. It is only with God's help that we can examine our hearts, listen to others, in order to understand their perspective and work together toward unity. While racism can be expressed systemically, it is ultimately a matter of the heart of people. So if we want to live in a society with less racism, we need to view others as God views them. More than that, we need to love them like Jesus loves, to lay our down our lives for others, as he's called us to do. And to do so, we need the redemption of Christ, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. All of us would do well to see other people love, uh, to see as, to think about it this way, to see, to see each other as people who are loved by God. That we, every person that we see is a person who Christ died for, whom we are called to love, no matter the color of our skin or what part, you know, or what part of the human race we are. Now to conclude, verses 11 to 13 in chronicle the rest of Cain's life, the rest of Cain's tragic story. Verse 13 lets us know that Cain, he recognized the severity of his, his punishment. He paid a high price for his sin all the days that he lived in this world. As a society, we're paying a high price for our sin of racism. And some are going to pay even worse. But when he came, he was banished from his home. He was banished from his family. He was consigned to a horrible, desperate existence. Don't let that happen to you. Do not walk in the way of Cain. You need a Savior, and there's only one. His name is Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. He died on the cross to open up a way of salvation for you. If you will come to him, if you'll come to God through him, you will be accepted by God. Your sins will be forgiven. You'll be saved. If you try to go another way, you know, then you, you're going to die in your sins. You're going to go to hell. A lot of people don't want to hear that truth. 
But Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father, no one goes to heaven except for him. Do you need to come to Jesus? If you do, the time to come to him is now. If you're out there watching today, and you don't know God at all, I want to close by offering an invitation to you so that you may have a relationship with God. You get to know God through His Son, Jesus Christ. There has to be a moment when you believe in Jesus because, listen to this, life without Jesus is a hopeless end, but life with Jesus is an endless hope. It doesn't stop. Have you asked Jesus Christ to come into your life? If not, why don't you do it right now? Just pray this prayer. I'm going to just do it here in a second. Just pray this prayer. Pray it out loud. Right where you're at. If you're on your couch out there somewhere, if you're at your kitchen table, you might still be in bed. If you want to get down on your knees and close your eyes and fold your hands, do so. But I want you right now to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To take that unrepentant heart and give it over to God. Just say this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior. I need you in my life, Lord. Give me hope. Give me purpose. I want to begin in this new relationship with you, Lord. Thank you for hearing my prayer and answering my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to the family of God. And our service is not over yet. One of the things we want to do is enter into that relationship that, through the act and service of the community. And so I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Mindy right now and let her take, take this part of the service for us. God bless you.
for forgiveness. Give forgiveness to someone else that you're harboring unforgiveness against so that we can prepare ourselves to come to the communion table with pure hearts and with clean hands this morning. Let's just take a second. Lord, we love you. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for our, our hardened hearts, Lord. Forgive us for not forgiving others, Lord.
God, we love you. We pray for Pam this morning, God. We pray for your hand upon her eyes, upon her heart, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to heal and to restore what was taken from her, her eyesight, these strokes that she's had, Lord. God, I pray that you would just surround Peter and Pam with your love this morning. Help them to know, Lord, that we stand with them as a church, as their family, to lift them up and to pray. And God, my heart goes out to Joni and to Manuel and to Ida, to Charles, to Samantha this morning, God. I've had tears of just, can't believe they're not with us right now, that they're in Texas seeking out healing treatments for Samantha. God, we lift this little girl up to you, this eight-year-old little girl that hasn't been getting good reports. Her kidneys are failing. There's not a lot of hope and promise. But God, we pray right now that you would restore the hope, that you would touch her body and you would heal her, Father God. There's no amount of miles that family wouldn't go, that parents and grandparents wouldn't journey on to receive healing. So God, we pray for a touch. I pray that our this, the Ramos family would know your love this morning, that they would feel their church surrounding them. They would feel the power of your Holy Spirit over them. And God, I pray for a healing touch in her body this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, just touch them. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you. Be with Carl as he's in Idaho this week, Lord. Being spending time with family and celebrating your great granddaughter's celebration, her graduation. Lord, just be with our church family, Lord, wherever they may be this morning. Be with our son-in-law who's taking really important board exams all day yesterday and today in Idaho, Lord. That your hand would be upon him, that you would Fill him with strength and your empowerment this day, Lord. God, we pray for Russ, for Caroline's brother in New Zealand. God, we thank you for the healing that you're doing in his body. We pray that you would continue to move and to work and to bring complete healing and restoration to him this morning. Lord, we love you. Heal relationships, heal marriages, heal children return wayward children to you this morning Lord. and father god we just thank you we thank you that you're on the throne of our lives lord and god we look forward to the day when we can gather again god may that day come soon and lord we love you this morning and we thank you in jesus name amen we love you guys we love you we praise your name Let's sing this last song together. Your love speaks a better. 